right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Happy Friday. I think it's Friday. All right. So today, the United States will demonstrate our continued enduring commitment to Ukraine's ability to defend itself with the announcement of over $3 billion in new military assistance to Ukraine, including $2.8 billion drawdown for Ukraine, the largest yet. My colleagues at the Department of Defense will brief on this in further detail later this afternoon, but the package is expected to include the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles we announced just yesterday, self-propelled howitzers, MRAPs, and other armed personnel carriers, Gimlers, rockets, surface-to-air uh, missiles as well, anti-vehicle landmines, ammunition, and other items from DOD inventories as well as $225 million in foreign military financing for Ukraine to build the long-term capacity and modernization of Ukraine's military. Today's assistance also includes $682 million for regional partners and allies on NATO's eastern flank to incentivize and backfill donations of military equipment. As the President said yesterday, the war is at a critical point and we must do everything that we can to help the Ukrainians resist Russian aggression. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague John to share more about the President's upcoming trip to Mexico City and take any questions that you may all have on this new PDA uh, announcement to Ukraine. Okay. No problem. Good afternoon, everybody. The uh, President's very much looking forward to heading to Mexico City for the North America Leaders Summit uh, next week. Our partnership with Canada and with Mexico is crucial to our economic security, prosperity, democratic stability, and of course migration management. And this North American Leaders Summit will give us all an opportunity to strengthen those partnerships and advance shared priorities for North America. As part of the trip uh, on Monday, uh, January 9th, the President will meet bilaterally with President Lope Lopez Obrador, Mexico. Then on Tuesday, uh, January 10th, he'll have a chance to meet bilaterally with Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. And then later that day, later on Tuesday, uh, all three leaders will gather together for the, uh, the for formal agenda of the, of the 10th North American Leaders Summit. Since taking office, President Biden has built and strengthened solid institutional frameworks for cooperation in North America on issues that, of course, span economic development to security to migration. Uh, all in order to produce concrete results and in a way that will uh, help extend all that security and prosperity well into the future. Um, as an example, uh, quite frankly, of the strong cooperation that we have uh, in the region on migration, uh, we've implemented innovative uh, approaches, just particularly with Mexico, uh, to help address the challenge of irregular migration, which have led uh, to some significant progress. And I think you saw yesterday the President talked about this, as well as Secretary Mayorkas and refer you back to their comments about some of the, the new policies and, and uh, initiatives that are, uh, that are in play to, uh, to both expand legal migration and pathways to legal uh, uh, immigration, as well as to crack down on enforcement. Now, we're also making strides alongside our partners to, to, uh, to address the significant drug issues uh, around the border, uh, particularly uh, with respect to, to fentanyl um, and seizing record levels of that. Uh, before it enters the country. In fact, since, since August of last year, Customs and Border Patrol agents have seized more than 20,000 pounds of fentanyl. It's an ongoing effort. It's not something you can ever take your foot off the gas on, and we're going to continue to do that as well, and that will be certainly part of the discussion uh, down in Mexico City. In fact, as you know, the North American Drug Dialogue, which includes efforts to increase information sharing on precursor chemicals and strengthening our public health approaches for prevention, harm, reduction, treatment uh, and recovery services has been very successful, and again, we're going to continue to work on that. Re redoubling our efforts to address climate and, climate and environmental challenges uh, by undertaking efforts to reduce methane emissions in the waste sector and decarbonize public transportation also will be on the agenda here at Mexico City, um, as will strengthening and, ex and expanding North American supply chains for semiconductors, critical minerals, and electrical, I'm sorry, electric vehicle uh, batteries. All these investments in uh, North America will benefit the United States, uh, and by taking advantage of game-changing legislation under the Biden administration, including the Infl Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act, President Biden will use this North America Leaders Summit 
to keep driving North America's economic competitiveness and help promote inclusive growth and prosperity. So very, very exciting couple of days uh, uh, in Mexico City. The President is very much looking forward to that and happy to take some questions. Thanks, John. Can you talk about any national security implications uh, of the fact that there are no members of the House who are sworn in at this time? We have vehicles to continue to communicate with both chambers uh, of, of uh, Congress, um, and uh, and that communication will continue um, uh, throughout the foreseeable future. So there, there's no particular worry or concern that um, national security will be put at uh, at, uh, uh, at you know significant risk here because we do have ability to, to continue some some level of communication. But there are members who have said, for example, uh, they can't get a security clearance right now, so they can't receive classified briefing. Sure. They've sent requests to various <coughs> agencies like the IRS. They've been told they have to wait until they're sworn in. So what kind of impact does that have on the government's ability to function? Well, there, there's obviously going to be some impact here as new members are waiting to get cleared and, and get committee assignments and all that. I, I, I don't want to suggest that there's not going to be any national security um, uh, impacts. But in terms of the American people worrying about whether uh, the federal government uh, and this administration can continue to look after our national security interests, that, that should not be an overriding concern. There are vehicles and ways in which we can continue to communicate key priorities um, uh, and developments. Uh, even such as the notification over this uh, presidential drawdown uh, package that Kareem just announced. All that was done, uh, you know, uh, appropriately. Um, so that work will continue. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kareem. Um, can we talk about why is now the right time to send Bradley's to Ukraine? Obviously, the Ukrainians have been asking them for them for some time. Is there any kind of new security threat that's motivating this? So the aid that we provide Ukraine from a security perspective is very much in keeping with two things. One, the needs that they have in the moment and our ability to provide uh, those capabilities to them, but also taking a look at what the fight is likely to be going forward. Now, you know, in recent weeks, we've all been uh, very focused, rightly so, on what was going on around Kherson down in the south. But the fighting in the east, particularly the Donbass region, has been particularly vicious in, in recent weeks. Uh, and we see every indication that the Russians continue to want to propagate uh, their efforts uh, in uh, in the Donbass, uh, particularly around uh, Bakhmut. And we've talked about that, I think, at some length. Um, and that area of Ukraine, uh, it's lo a lot of farmland, a lot of open ground, and it lends itself well uh, to the kinds of capabilities that are in this particular PDA package. And the Bradley fighting vehicles are are very significant in terms of being able to do what we call combined arms maneuver warfare. You might remember the Pentagon just recently said they're going to start training at a battalion level Ukrainian troops outside the country on combined arms maneuver, because that's really what they need to, to help continue to improve their ability in that area of Ukraine. So it's very much tied to the war that we're seeing on the ground right now and what we anticipate we'll see throughout the winter months. We also talked about the fact that we didn't think fighting was just going to stop in the winter, that uh, that these two sides were going to continue to, to slug it out, and that, and that has occurred. Uh, and I think, again, the, the Bradleys are just one capability. Take a look at the whole package when you see the Pentagon. Uh, they'll, they'll lay it out more uh, in depth this afternoon, but you'll see that the whole package that goes along with this um, is, is well suited to the needs that the Ukrainian armed forces have right now. Thank you. Um, I have two foreign policy questions, John. Uh, first, on the Wall Street Journal is reporting that the administration is easing tension with Saudi Arabia, and they might not uh, go ahead with the review. Can you uh, comment if this is actually accurate, and how far are we in the review? And second, on Turkey, as you know, the, this kind of rapprochement between Turkey and the Assad regime with the mediation of the Russians. Um, do you believe that this is the right step? Uh, from the administration point of view, and will the Kurds pay the price for this? So the second question, the answer, short answer is no. Uh, we haven't normalized relations uh, with the Assad regime, and we uh, uh, we wouldn't encourage any uh, nation state to normalize relations with uh, the Assad regime. Um, uh, but we'll see where these talks go and what actually comes out of this. I don't want to get ahead of where they are, but we obviously don't support normalization with Assad. Um, on, uh, um, I'm sorry, your first question was Saudis. Saudis thank you. Um, the, the president has been consistent and clear that he wants 
this bilateral relationship, like any bilateral relationship we have, uh, to be well suited to the interests of the American people and to our national security. And we're going to continue to take a look at that relationship. Look, Saudi Arabia is a strategic partner, 80 some odd years. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's important that that strategic partnership continue, but it's also important that it continues in a way that is completely consistent with our values and our interests. And the president wants to continue to take a look at it to make sure that that's the case. Thanks, Grace. Uh, John, two <coughs> questions. One, um, you outlined a little bit, but I wonder if you could say what specific actions uh, the administration would like to see Mexico take to stop fentanyl production and smuggling. Well, I don't want to get ahead of the uh, the actual summit. They're going to talk about uh, a lot of this, and, and Mexico already has taken uh, uh, significant steps. You saw just, uh, well, I think it was yesterday, um, uh, addressing, uh, 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 sorry, arresting Mr. Guzman, a, a key fentanyl trafficker. Um, that that is not an insignificant accomplishment by Mexican authorities, and we're certainly grateful for that. Uh, so we're going to continue to work with them uh, in lockstep to see uh, what we can do jointly to try to limit that flow. Uh, but it's significant. And uh, again, as I said, you know, we we haven't. It hasn't. It's not like we haven't been had some success. I mean, twenty thousand pounds is a lot, but it just keeps coming. And so we've got to make sure that um, that we are doing what we have what we have to do in our own authority and on our own, obviously in in sovereign U.S. Territory, but that we're continuing to work with Mexico and partner with them. Just one follow-up: Was the U.S. involved in any way in Guzman's arrest? Um, and is is there a push for him to be extradited? This was a Mexican operation, and so I'll certainly let the Mexican authorities uh, speak to that. Um, and I'll refer you to DOJ on extradition issues. Uh, that's that's beyond my scope. Thank you, Chris. Um, John, with the new parole program that you guys announced yesterday. Is there any risk that because now those who don't qualify for the program, they won't have any incentive to turn themselves in, as a lot of people have been doing when they illegally cross the border, and that that could increase the number of gotaways? That, first, I would definitely refer you to, to DHS for more detail on this. What we're trying to do with this new parole program, because we, we watched how it worked with Venezuela, um, by putting in place a process where a legal pathway was available, um, we were able to reduce by 90 percent um, uh, Venezuelans who were trying to, to come into the country illegally. Um, so we have, some, we have some tangible results here that we can, that we can apply uh, now to these additional three countries that Secretary Mayorkas talked about yesterday. Um, and so we, we feel there's great promise here. Um, the, the idea Jackie, and I, I couldn't speculate about your question, but the idea is to increase the legal pathways available to people and put in place a, a nice, safe, orderly process that, that is humane and gives them the hope that, they, that they're looking for, at the same time being able to crack down on enforcement. And cracking down on enforcement is not an insignificant part of what the president uh, announced yesterday, including adding now another 300 agents to the border. And he looks forward to going down there this weekend and, and seeing that enforcement uh, and that process in place for himself. I understand what the objective is, obviously, but as the pilot program with Venezuela was happening and, and did reduce um, the number of crossings by 90 percent over those first few weeks that it was in place, the, the number of gotaways did skyrocket, too, at the same time. And so it, it, my question is, does the fact that if you cross illegally, uh, it makes you ineligible for this program, does that now disincentivize people to turn themselves in and then make part of this problem harder? It's difficult for me to get in the mind of every individual that may have, may have already crossed over uh, illegally. What they ought to know is that we are going to be making sure that we're increasing our ability to enforce these policies uh, and to crack down on illegal entry. Um, and, 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 I'm sorry? With more agents, or? The, yes, I mean, obviously, the, the president's going to order uh, another 300 to, to the border, and he's working in lockstep with Secretary Mayorkas on whatever other uh, avenues might, might be appropriate in terms of better enforcement. Um, but, I, again, I can't get in the mind of everybody who may already be in the country. They ought to know that, as Secretary Mayorkas, I think, said very eloquently yesterday, we're not only a nation of immigrants, we're a nation of laws. Um, and we're, we are going to scrupulously follow the law, 
and we expect them to as well if they want to become legal citizens of the United States. Can I follow up quickly on Ukraine? John, when will those Bradleys arrive and will they have tank killing tow missiles on them? I'm not going to get into the specific kitting out of each Bradley vehicle. There's Is that a part of this package? I, I won't, again, I'm not going to, I'll let the Pentagon speak to the details of how each vehicle may be or may not be fitted out. Uh, uh, it will be some time before they can actually get into country. Um, and I, I couldn't give you a date certain on the calendar. What I can tell you, well, what I can tell you is we're going to do it as fast as we can. And this is not a system that will require uh, an, an exorbitant amount of training uh, for the Ukrainians. I mean, it's a fighting vehicle, um, and, and it's, uh, again, very well suited to combined arms warfare, but it's not so sophisticated that it'll take them very long to learn it, not only to operate it, but to maintain it. And as your question, I think, alludes, there are different ways you can fit these things out for the for the fight that you're in. And I don't know, and again, I'd refer to my Pentagon colleagues, I don't know that they've made all that uh, all those decisions per each vehicle just yet. Is it that, uh, you were just talking about training, just to follow up on that, on Patriot missiles, has that training begun in earnest somewhere in Europe? They wouldn't identify the third country in which it would occur, but has that training begun of the Ukrainians who would use I'm the Patriot I'm not battery? aware that the training has actually begun. I certainly would refer you to the Pentagon for specifics on that. Uh, what I can tell you is that the training will be held outside of Ukraine. So let me ask one separate question on the border then, to follow up on what she was asking about. There's reporting that El Paso has cleared the downtown of these expansive migrant camps that have grown there in advance of the president's arrival. Is the president going to see a sanitized version of El Paso when he arrives at the border on Sunday? The president's very much looking forward to seeing for himself firsthand uh, what the uh, border security situation looks like, particularly in El Paso. He's very much also looking forward to getting a chance to, to talk to Customs and Border Patrol agents on the ground who are actually involved in this mission uh, to get their firsthand perspectives of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, John, so first of all, I would like to follow up on Ukraine. Was the decision to provide the biggest package uh, to the day connected or made in response to a possible new Russian offensive and escalation? And do you think Ukraine is much better prepared now to counter this new offensive if Russia do that, if it comes from the north, from, for example? And a second one on Mexico, should we expect any agreement or announcement of funds while the president is in Mexico? I won't get ahead of the uh, president's trip to Mexico and, uh, and any announcements he might make. I'll reserve that for, for the president. Again, very important agenda, three big topics, climate change, migration, and, and drugs, particularly fentanyl, and the president's looking forward to addressing all three. I'll save the announcements for uh, the president. As for the, uh, the timing, I, th these drawdown packages, as you know, have been occurring about every couple of weeks or so. So this is the latest iteration. I think it would be incorrect for you to conclude that the amount, specific amount, was sort of driven by uh, rumors or, uh, or reports of a, a Russian counteroffensive. They are driven by an ongoing iterative conversation that we're having with the Ukrainians literally every day about the fight that they're in now and the fight that we expect them to be in going forward. Uh, we said, as I said earlier, we said weeks ago, we did not expect the fighting to stop in the winter. It hasn't. In fact, in some places, it's become even more vicious, Donbass particularly. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the Ukrainians are, are well kitted out and well suited for the fighting that's in, uh, that they're going to be facing in the next couple of months. Do you think Ukrainians are better prepared now to counter? The Ukrainians have, uh, have, I mean, better prepared. They are, they are and have been able to maintain um, a quite impressive level of readiness for what they're facing. And what's been really uh, impressive to see is the way that they have, have modified not only their needs, but their abilities in the field to the fighting that they're facing. Obviously, we were all talking, we're talking about Bradley's today, but recently we've been talking about air defense capabilities and the innovative way in which they're using what is being provided to them. Um, so I don't, I, they never fail, I don't think, to surprise or impress with their ability to adapt in real time to the challenges that they're facing, uh, and to be quite candid and honest and forthright with all of our, their, their, their partners, including the United States, uh, about what they need to continue to do that. So I have two questions for you. The first one is following up on Nancy's earlier question um, about the national security concerns or potential concerns um, as there remains no Speaker of the House and 
not a functioning House of Representatives, would you be giving the same answer if this process were to drag on for a couple more days, say we ask the same question a week from now? In other words, can you continue to you know, contain the national security concerns for a while or indefinitely? I mean, clearly we obviously love, and the President talked about this, we'd, we'd prefer to see um, all of this resolved as soon as possible. It's, it's not, not just from a national security perspective, but from a democratic perspective. Um, I, I don't want to speculate about how long things would go before there would be, um, you know, some uh, much, a deeper concern about national security implications. I can just tell you that we're confident that we can continue to defend the United States of America uh, while um, House Republicans are working their way through this process. Um, we're going to stay on top of that challenge every single day. And we have, again, vehicles in place to communicate as appropriate with both chambers of Congress, co Congress right now. And then just on the President's visit to the border, does he have a desire to, does he have a plan to meet with asylum seekers while he is there? I, I, uh, I won't get ahead much more of the schedule than what I've done. He's, he's really going to focus uh, on two things, and that's the, the migration challenge, obviously, uh, and having a chance to meet directly with those who are in charge of it. The other thing I failed to say when I was talking to Jackie uh, and Peter was that he also wants to uh, focus on the flow of fentanyl, too. So I think you'll see him um, have opportunities to, to take a look at that and learn a little bit more about what we're doing on the fentanyl side. So he may meet with some of the I, 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 don't, I don't have anything more on the schedule to, to speak to with, specific, with yeah. specificity. Um, just uh, following up on the, on the border, I, I spent a long time covering immigration stuff during the Trump years. Um, I, I, I never saw more um, damning quotes from immigration advocacy groups and human rights groups um, during the Trump years that, as I saw yesterday towards this administration. Um, just reading one to you, Eleanor Acer, who's one of the leading advocacy people at le heads up a, a refugee group, called um, what the president did yesterday a humanitarian disgrace. And that was echoed across the board in literally scores of emails I got from every humanitarian group. What do you all, what does the administration say to the overwhelming consensus from people who advocate on behalf of asylum seekers and refugees and migrants that what the president did yesterday was a humanitarian disgrace? Well, obviously we take a different view. Uh, what we would say is that uh, this is a president who uh, understands uh, that uh, safe and legal uh, immigration into this country um, is a key cornerstone of our own um, security and prosperity, and that he is advancing ways to improve those legal pathways to entry. I mean, he increased or uh, dramatically increased the number of refugees that we're willing to take in from nations in, in the hemisphere. Um, he uh, also Im improved uh, the process by which uh, people seeking asylum can do that in, again, a legal, safe way. Um, uh, and uh, we're also obviously uh, have to make sure that uh, that it's legal migration we're focused on and that the illegal migration is curbed as best as we can through more uh, more stringent enforcement mechanism. So it's a balance, and the president's trying to strike that balance. Uh, but he is, and I think you saw it in the uh, uh, in all the initiatives that were announced yesterday. I mean, there's a uh, you, you know striking that balance. You, you can't forget that you that we do as a nation of immigrants have an obligation to provide uh, uh, better tools and pathways for them to come in. I'll say this. On his first day in office, he put before Congress uh, an immigration reform bill that he that has yet to be acted on. We are dealing with immigration laws and processes that are decades old, Michael, decades old. So the the answer to the critics is, uh, first of all, we obviously take a different view in terms of the president's priorities. And if you take a look at the package, you'll see uh, that it is very humane in its in, in its structure. But we've got to have the help for members of Congress. And this is not something that he hasn't focused on. In fact, he has been focused on it since the very first day. Do you understand their points? Uh, thank you, Greg. John, um, the parole <coughs> program obviously was designed uh, to address uh, nationals from Haiti, Cuba, Venezuela, arriving at the southwest border. But as you know, a lot of uh, Cubans and Haitians in, in particular yeah. are crossing the, the, uh, the Strait of Florida Strait. 
uh, by sea, very dangerous journey. Incredible. Um, how, how does this plan at all address those individuals? What should the individuals considering uh, that path take from yesterday? Secretary Marcus talked about this too yesterday, and obviously our message to them is don't take that journey. I myself have sailed those waters, and it, it can be treacherous, particularly at this time of year. And if you're in a, an, an unsafe craft or a craft that's not made for, uh, for those seas, it's very, very dangerous. So the first message is don't take that journey. There are legal pathways. The president is opening up more um, uh, for uh, people from those countries to, 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 to get in uh, to the United States, um, and we want, them, we want them to use those legal pathways, which we are now, again, improving. Will, will those individuals they're not going to be uh, removed to Mexico, for example. So are they more likely to get uh, an interview based on a, a credible fear claim if they make that journey? That's the question that a lot of these individuals are asking. Again, I'd refer you to DHS for more detail on this. I'm not an expert on that particular process. Um, uh, we, we, the, we want people to use and, and of course, Secretary Marcus talked about this yesterday. Now, you know, there's a new app here in place for people to, uh, to be able to apply appropriately for asylum specifically. Um, and if you choose not to try the legal path, then the United States will, as Secretary Marcus said, use the tools at our disposal, tools which are old, but tools that we have uh, to, to stop your entry into the country. Thanks, Supreme. John, um, on Mexico, the U.S. energy industry feels that the administration is dragging its feet on negotiations over Mexico's potential trade violations. Has the administration considered taking the step of calling for a panel to resolve that dispute, and should we expect any resolution on that from the leaders next week? I, I don't have any information on about a, a panel that would be stood up. Uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of the president, but clearly trade issues uh, will be on the agenda next week. Follow up to my colleague's question on uh, uh, another Russian offensive. What is switching topics? What is the U.S. assessment right now of the potential for another Russian assessment at Ukrainian Spear? Our assessment of another Russian assessment? I'm sorry, I meant to say offensive. Offensive. Yeah. Um, well, assessment I, of an offensive. <laughs> Very eloquently put. Not really. <laughs> I was trying to throw you a bone, buddy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, let me put it this way, because I don't want to ever get in the business of, uh, of, uh, of being uh, a spokesman for the Russian Defense Ministry. Um, well, that's eloquent. <laughs> they, uh, they have been on the offensive now for 10 months. We can't forget that. So when I hear all the talk about a Russian counteroffensive or a Russian offensive, you guys have seen this the same as I do. They've been on the offense every single day for the last 10 months, trying to take away Ukrainian lives, Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, and certainly Ukrainian territory. And we're seeing that play out right now, as you and I are talking, Jeff, in, in Bakhmut and in the Donbass. They have made incremental gains in the last few days. Now, we'll see where it goes in, in, in Bakhmut. Uh, but in certain places along that front, they, are, they remain on the offensive. Now, whether they're going to redouble their efforts uh, and to what degree that will be successful, uh, I couldn't possibly tell you because I just don't know what uh, their intentions day to day are. That's why it's so important that we continue to support Ukraine in the way that we have been. The package that uh, Kareem just announced, biggest one ever, but it, I, I, I invite you to take a look at what's in it uh, and you'll see that we really are trying to tailor the support we're giving to Ukraine for the fight that they're in and the fight that we expect them to be in over the next couple of months. And we certainly expect over the next couple of months that the Russians aren't just going to throw up their hands and stop or just dig in. Now, there are, per there are places along the line where they are. Down in the south, they've largely assumed what we would call a defense in depth. They're not really on the move too much. But that is not the case uh, in the northeast up in the, in the Donbass region. So, again, I won't speak for their... The specific tactical plans, they have remained on the offense in places in Ukraine. We think that that's, that's going to continue, certainly for the next couple of months, and that's why this package was so important today. Mary to follow on Michael's question about the pushback that the president's immigration plan is receiving, I guess to put a finer point on it, one of the central criticisms is that the administration is expanding Title 42 while also claiming to, to be preparing for it to end. So when it comes to Title 42, are you trying to have it both ways? 
No, no. I mean, uh, right now, uh, Title 40, first of all, as you, public, the Title 42 is a public health order. It, it, it's being used and was used, I'm sorry, was used by the previous administration as an immigration policy. It's not. What we need is real immigration reform, and for that we need legislation that we have sadly not seen. It is not designed to be and shouldn't be used as uh, an immigration policy, but we, in anticipation of it going away and being able to make sure under Title VIII we can do the kinds of enforcement activities and mechanisms we need, yes, we are looking at uh, expanded enforcement temporarily under 42 uh, with the expectation fully uh, that it will go away. And that, that expansion, I, I, again, I, I beg you to keep in mind, is in response to literally a historic, unprecedented level of migration uh, from uh, south of us in this hemisphere. I mean, uh, w people that are escaping uh, 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 intolerable circumstances uh, in places like Nicaragua and Venezuela, Haiti. Uh, and um, uh, so we do need to keep it in perspective. The, the numbers and the scale of the migration challenge is really not something we've seen any time uh, in the last hundred years or so. And just one more on this. Mexico has now agreed to take 30,000 migrants from these four countries who attempt to cross the border That's illegally. Right. Did the U.S. provide or are we providing any assistance, any aid to Mexico to, to deal with that influx? I'm not aware of any specific um, uh, infrastructure improvements or that kind of thing, but I'll tell you what, I'll take the question and ask because I just don't know. I'd also refer you to DHS on that. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks, Thank you John. guys. All right. Okay, guys. All right, uh, just a couple of things, uh, and then, uh, as you know, we have an event that the president's doing, so I want to lay this out for, for all of you. Um, so two years after the assault on the Capitol, the president will uh, host a ceremony at the White House where he will deliver remarks and award the Presidential Citizens Medal to individuals who made exemplary contributions to our democracy surrounding January 6, 2021. These heroes demonstrated courage and selflessness during a moment of peril of our nation. They include Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police, election workers and officials at the state and local level from both parties. Yesterday we announced the names of 12 patriots who will be recognized this afternoon. And now I have two additional posthumous recipients to announce. Uh, the first one is Howard Lee Bingood, was a U.S. Capitol Police officer who defended the Capitol on January 6. The son of a U.S. Senate Sergeant at Arms, Officer Liebengood died after battling insurrectionists at the Capitol and staying on to restore security in the crucial days after January 6. Officer Liebengood's painful loss helped change the law to better honor the unimaginable sacrifice that too many officers and their families face. Second, Jeffrey L. Smith was a Metropolitan Police Department officer who defended the Capitol on January 6. As he fought the violent mob, Officer Smith sustained devastating head injuries from multiple assaults inside and outside the Capitol. He died after protecting Congress, guarding the Capitol, and preserving our democracy. His passing sparked changes in the law that honor the silent injuries of our fallen officers. All of these individuals reflect the best of America, our shared values, and the president looks forward to celebrating them today. Now, turning to the president's week ahead schedule, just a couple of things uh, later today. As you all know, the president will travel to Wilmington, Delaware, and he will return uh, back to D.C. tomorrow. As you just heard, uh, just heard from my colleague, on Sunday the President will travel to El Paso, Texas and to Mexico City for the North American Leaders Summit. The President will return to the White House on Tuesday evening. On Friday the President looks forward to welcoming Prime Minister Kushida of Japan to the White House to further deepen ties between our governments, economies and our people. Over the past year, the two leaders have worked closely together to modernize uh, the U.S.-Japan al alliance, expand our cooperation on key issues from climate change to critical technologies, including through the Quad, and advance a free and open Indo-Pacific. President Biden and Prime Minister Kushida will build on those efforts. Afterwards, the president will, will head to Wilmington, Delaware, later in that week. Sung-Ming?
you want to take us take us uh, take us out? Follow up. Um, so I was going to ask John about um, does the White House believe the arrest of Guzman was timed intentionally at all ahead of next week's summit? So. Um, Look, I, I'm not going to get into speculation here or um, um, from here. I'll ref I would have to refer you to the government of Mexico uh, to, for, to discuss that particular question. That is for something for them to, to address. And following up on a version of what Nancy was asking earlier, <coughs> does the White House, the administration, have any clarity on whether members of Congress who haven't yet been sworn in can actually do services on behalf of their constituents? Can they contact federal agencies? If they can't interact, then how is the administration stepping in to help people who need help from the IRS or USCIS or other agencies? So our, our administration is going to do everything that we can, all that it can, to ensure that the House of Representatives is kept informed as needed. Right, and including a, a course of, uh, including of course on matters of national security, we are going to do everything that we can from here. Agencies uh, can continue to help House offices uh, with constituent services uh, to extent possible, consistent with the law and House rules and practices. Uh, for more specifics on the individual uh, caseworks or, or programs, I would refer you to those specific agencies. I know the IRS has uh, come up uh, in, in during this briefing. But look, here's the thing, uh, you know, we hope that the House resolves this soon. Uh, it has been a couple of days now, and we have important work to do for the American people. And so we have to, to get back to work here. But of course, the administration is going to continue to do everything that we can uh, to ensure that the House of Representatives are, are kept informed and have uh, what they need uh, on behalf of the American people. Um, just in terms of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, which obviously the President has called on Congress to enact over and over again, what is his sort of theory of the case right now for getting that done? Will he be taking his own actions to do outreach to members? Does he basically consider that a top priority going into the new Congress? So first of all, it is a top priority. I mean, the President put forth a comprehensive immigration reform on day one. So him doing that that first day of office, the first day that he walked into the administration and sat behind the resolute de desk, clearly states that this is a priority for him and will continue to, to be so. Uh, and look, uh, we will continue to call on Congress to act. Uh, that will not stop. And look, I, I also want to just put this in a broader context here. The President inherited a mess because of what the last administration did. They inherited a, we inherited a mess. And, uh, you know, Republicans in Congress made it worse by blocking comprehensive immigration reform. And so what you're seeing from this president is he's acting. He's acting to protect, uh, to continue to protect the border, secure the border, and also deal with irregular migration. That is what he's going to continue to do that. So the enforcement measures we announced yesterday will result in more, not fewer, legal pathways for migration while easing the pressures on our broken immigration system, which has been broken for decades. And so uh, the NGOs and the border communities that support those arriving at our southwest border. Uh, but honestly, yes, the President made an announcement. He's made this a priority. He's made other announcements before today on what we're doing at the border, by especially with the um, uh, historic funding that he's put forth. But in order to fix what is happening currently uh, is to make sure that we have comprehensive uh, immigration reform, and that's what he's going to continue to call on. He was very eloquent yesterday. He talked about the history of this country. He talked about how we were a country of immigrants. He talked about our responsibility. But at the same time, uh, we have to make sure uh, it is done in a legal way and that we have pathways, uh, additional pathways, uh, for folks to do that. I guess we have a pretty good sense of what it looks like typically when the President sees something as being a top <coughs> urgent legislative priority. So, you know, will we be getting readouts of him making phone calls to lawmakers? Will we see members coming here? Will he sort of throw everything he has at this problem that he says he wants to get fixed? So, look, I, I, there's been many initiatives that we have gotten done, uh, especially historic pieces of legislation that the President has done in the past two years that we haven't laid out everything, right? We think about the Inflation Reduction Act. We didn't lay out every step of who he was talking to. Matter of fact, most of you all were surprised 
uh, when that uh, was announced, the Inflation Reduction Act was, was announced. So look, the President's going to continue to have conversations with member of Congress. His team will do that on a array of issues that matter to this White House, and it matters to this White House because it matters to the American people. Um, and so that's what we're going to continue to do. I do want to address something that was asked, uh, that you, Michael, had asked. Uh, about the, uh, the lack of support that we have received. Look, I, I have, uh, you know, we've heard from mayors across the country as well who have supported, uh, you know, the president's announcement yesterday. And so, for example, Mayor, Mayor Todd Gloria, San Diego, California, the president's measures will help expedite legal pathways for orderly migration and increase funding uh, to nonprofits doing life-saving work in our communities. That matters. Mayor, Mayor, Mayor of uh, San Antonio, Texas, in lieu, and this is Texas, in lieu of much needed congressional policy, as I've stated, which is so important, and he tweeted this, uh, the president knew action humanely addresses the influx of asylum seekers entering the U.S. Eric Adams, had, as Mayor Adams, had, who has been critical, right, of, of us, said uh, it's an important positive step. And so, uh, and I have a few more, Den the Denver mayor, the Washington DC, Muriel Bowser, and also uh, Mayor Lightfoot. They all have said, uh, have said they support the president's actions, and I think that's important to note as well. Uh, look, look, we know there's more work to do. We absolutely know that. And what the, pro the president is doing is he's using the tools in front of him right now uh, to uh, address a really critical and important issue. If I could just, uh, sorry, sure. but yeah, yeah. you raised the yeah, the, I know, the, since the, I called you out, Michael. <laughs> I mean, the, the advocacy folks in, in the community of people who are lawyers and, and, and advocates and humanitarian experts, what they would say is the president is using the tools, and he's using them in, in uh, a harsh and unbalanced way. I mean, I think John referenced the, you know, trying to balance these, these issues, and yes, that, that's true, um, but they would argue that the impact uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sort of the long-term functioning of the asylum process in the country is extraordinarily negative. And they, you know, lawsuits are going to be filed in the same way that lawsuits, you know, were filed against the Trump administration over and over and over again about their immigration uh, policies. Um, but, you know, this yeah. time it'll be against you guys. And I, and I guess I just, I guess I just, that, that, that puts this president, who spent so much time on the campaign trail, talking about how, uh, you know, how he wanted to be different than Donald Trump uh, when it came to immigration issues. I mean, it just puts you guys in a really so awkward, awkward I, place, doesn't it? I, I, have to, I have to say, Michael, I, I take, look, I, I understand what you're saying, but I do take, um, uh, you know, uh, I do take issue with comparing us to Donald Trump, who, no, 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 I, I know you are the messenger and you are giving me the information. I am responding to what you just said, which is you're talking about an administration who had a policy, right, that tore babies away from their moms, from their parents, from their families. That was the president's, uh, president, uh, the last administration, that president's uh, uh, philosophy or policies, and that's what they did. And this is not this president. And just want to list out a couple of things what this administration has done. It's increased work visas, including H-2A and H-2B visas for Central America and Haiti. It restarted the Central uh, American Minors Program, expanded parolee programs for Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Haiti, as we've been talking about these past few minutes, expanded refugee admissions in the Western Hemisphere, significantly expanded TPS for Venezuela, Haiti, Nicaragua, and m many more, uh, and uh, created reunification parolee programs for families from Haiti and Cuba. These are the things that the President is trying to do to make sure we are doing this in, in a humane way. Now, is there work to do? Uh, is this just a, a one step? Yes. And we are going to uh, continue to work with Congress to make sure that we are truly fixing this problem. I'm going to continue to go around. Go ahead. So I wanted to ask about how the White House is looking at what's happening in Congress right now in terms of the prospects of potentially raising the debt ceiling and then even further potentially forgetting even government spending deals. So look, as it relates to the, the debt limit, uh, our position has been very clear here. Uh, we have said that we, sh we should not be using the debt ceiling 
uh, as a matter of political brinksmanship. We've been very clear. If you look at what Republicans in Congress did uh, three times, three times during uh, the Trump administration, is that they were able to uh, they were able to deal with it in a in a uh, in a way that was responsible. Right? Uh, they voted three times again to lift the debt ceiling. And so Congress must, once again, be responsible. They must address uh, the debt ceiling. It is a shared responsibility uh, to, to pay previous debts uh, made by President and Congress on both sides. This is, a, this is not a partisan thing. This should be a bipartisan effort. Uh, and we're talking about including that $8 trillion in debt from the last administration. So again, uh, and, and let me add, and you've heard the President say this, you've heard me say this, this is a President that has uh, lowered the deficit uh, in, in, the, in the largest one-year reduction in U.S. history. So he is putting forth pieces of legislation that is lowering the deficit. So we are doing it in a responsible way, and we are asking Congress to do the same. Um, yes, uh, you announced uh, just a few minutes ago that two additional officers were going to be awarded uh, medals uh, posthumously. Uh, why were they announced today and not yesterday? Uh, no, no particular reason. I, we just wanted to make sure that uh, we were able to uh, have something to give to all of you in, in the briefing room, but there's no, no particular reason. We've been talking to families, uh, talking to, um, uh, you know, uh, individuals uh, about what we were trying to do to tomorrow, right, today, sorry, today's Friday, on, on, on this really critical, important day, on uh, lifting up and, and honoring the heroes. Uh, there's no particular reason, but wanted to give you, uh, you all an opportunity to... Uh, to have uh, a little bit of news you in the briefing room. No, 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 no. No, we wanted to look. We wanted to make sure that we gave you guys a little bit of, of um, a news uh, ahead of, of uh, the event. But also, we've had we've been having conversations with families all through this week, um, and wanted to make sure we did this in a fulsome way, in a real way that we captured as many people as we can. And we're not going to capture everyone, right? Um, but our team has been having those conversations, again, with family members, with individuals, and these were two people that we wanted to make sure uh, that were recognized. And so we, we decided to do this in the briefing room today ahead of the 2 o'clock. And for, regarding uh, the Mexico trip, uh, the Mexican government is very excited that President Biden will be flying into the new airport that uh, Mexico's <laughs> president is very fond of really? and <laughs> trying to promote. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm just wondering what was involved in the decision uh, and, and whether agreeing to fly into that airport is uh, diplomacy in action or something else. Oh, well, you know, it's always diplomacy in action, right? Uh, our diplomacy, our relationship with Mexico, one of our, uh, one of our closest neighbors, uh, is very important to this president. We have been working uh, together with the government of Mexico, at least with this administration, this past uh, two years. I don't have any specifics uh, to lay out how it happened and the, the magic behind the decision. Uh, but again, I think it shows uh, how important uh, that relationship is and, uh, and uh, also, um, you know, how, how we're looking to strengthen uh, that alliance as well. No, a I've never seen, who, I, Camila. Say, Camila, okay, hi, Camila, yes. hi. So you addressed some questions about the border announcement yesterday. I wanted to ask about a particular component of it. We reported today that members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus expressed serious concerns and frustrations to Secretary Mayorkas and some administration officials during a briefing yesterday about the announcement, particularly about this proposed regulation that would disqualify migrants from asylum if they enter the country illegally and did not ask for asylum in a country like Mexico. Is the administration open to changing that proposed regulation or even scrapping it in response to this feedback? And can you respond to the accusations that this is very similar to what the Trump administration tried to do back in 2019 to enact a similar asylum restriction? So look, I just want to say uh, this is uh, just the beginning of, of uh, the rule rulemaking process uh, with the ample time for comments further conversations and discuss discussion, new re no new regulations have been issued uh, much uh, less finalized, so I just want to be really clear. Uh, our legislative affairs team as well as teams of the Department of, of Homeland Security have been in close touch with Congress and will definitely uh, continue that to have those uh, those conversations, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I'm just saying that this is just the beginning, uh, the beginning of, of that. Um, as far as a comparison to, um, again, to the last administration, well, look, uh, you know, I would remind you that the Department of uh, Homeland Security and the Department of Justice are still working, uh, again, through their proposed regulation. 
and so and so want to be very careful there. Uh, but I want to also reiterate what S uh, Secretary Mayorkas said yesterday. We're creating a safe and orderly pathways for people who want to seek asylum in the United States to do so from where they are uh, without putting their lives in the hands of smugglers. And that is really important. That's why we always try to uh, make sure that the misinform there is no misinformation out there because that misinformation actually helps the smugglers and puts people's lives at risk. And for instance, as the Secretary said, people will be able to apply via DHS app uh, on their phone to make an appointment and arrive at a port of entry to make their asylum claim. Or they can seek to enter through the newly expanded parole uh, processes, parolee processes. That's not an uh, that's not. I know people have talk, been talking about an asylum ban. That is not an asylum ban. It's a safe, orderly, and humane process uh, for seeking uh, asylum. Again, we are going to continue to have conversations with members of Congress, with other, uh, um, you know, with other, um, uh, you know, uh, organizations out there to continue to have this conversation. Uh, but again, our priority is to do this in a safe and orderly orderly and humane way, and that's the path that we want to take. Quick question about the President's trip to El Paso on Sunday. Is he open to meeting with frontline Border Patrol agents because Homeland Security officials have conceded that morale among those agents well, I think, is very Well, uh, I think my colleague said that that's one of the things that he is going to do is meet with uh, um, uh, Border Patrol agents while he's down there. I don't want to get ahead of, of any specifics of, of that trip. We'll, we'll have more of this, something that the President is going to do. Thank you, Karine. Um, New York Mayor Adams, who you uh, quoted earlier, is requesting a billion dollars from the federal government to help uh, deal with the migration issue in the city. Um, New York has reportedly only uh, been approved for $8 million. Uh, does the Biden administration have plans to increase funding for New York and other cities, especially in conjunction with this new parole program? So um, as, as, uh, as the Department of Homeland Security announced yesterday, uh, we are in indeed increasing funding available to border cities uh, um, and those cities receiving an influx of migrants, in addition to strengthening ongoing coordination and collaboration across all levels of government. DHS is also uh, expanding outreach efforts with uh, cities to provide coordination of resources and technical assistance. Uh, we have been indeed facilitating uh, co coordination between the state and local, I think you've heard us say this before, state and local officials and also vet, uh, and uh, other federal agencies, uh, but for any specific on that funding to uh, New York City, I would refer you to DHS, but as I just stated, uh, he, uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security did announce uh, additional funding. And so we are going to uh, make those border cities uh, um, uh, definitely a, a priority as they are dealing with increased migration. Well, something that uh, Mr. Kirby said, yeah. uh, he said that the people from these four countries are escaping intoler intolerable circumstances. Um, I looked at the most recent month of data for um, people who cross the border and how they're uh, handled. Um, and it seems that under this new program, and please correct me if the data is outdated, um, it seems like you, you might have a better chance crossing the border and being allowed to stay than applying for this program uh, because there are only 30,000 slots per month. Look, I, I will go back to what I have said uh, and what the President has said. I think very passionately yesterday uh, and very um, precisely, which is that you know, we are g doing everything that we can uh, to secure the border uh, and uh, to deal with uh, irregular migration. Uh, that is a priority for this administration since day one. Uh, we understand this is one step. Uh, we understand to actually fix uh, what, what is happening, this broken immigration system that we have seen uh, for decades now, is to actually get legislation done. And so, uh, look, you know, um, what I have said and what many of us have said, like, we are ready to work. We are ready to put forth plans as we have. Uh, and, you know, again, Republicans in Congress and Republicans officials uh, across, uh, across the country who have done political stunts are not. And if they truly want to deal with this issue, they would come to the table and they would work with us on, on uh, immigration reform, to, true comprehensive immigration reform. And that's what we're going to continue to call for, and that's what you heard from this president. Go ahead. Uh, can you tell us why is now the right moment for the president to visit the border, and what was the thinking that went into El Paso specifically? Did you look at any other locations, or was that always the thinking you wanted to go? So, look, he wanted to assess uh, enforcement operations and meet local uh, local officials who have been important uh, partners. 
uh, in managing uh, the historical number of migrants uh, fleeing political oppression, as somebody just asked me about, and gang violence in Venezuela, in Haiti, in Nicaragua, and in Cuba. Uh, this is something that he wanted to see for himself. Uh, he will also, as I said many times just moments ago, as you heard him say, he'll call on Congress uh, to fully fund his request for record resources for, department, for the Department of Homeland Security uh, and uh, advance the comprehensive, again, immigration reform and border security <coughs> measures that is going to be needed. Uh, I don't want to get ahead. You'll hear definitely from the President clearly uh, in a couple of days on, um, on what he has to say or, you know, the next couple of days. Uh, but again, he wanted to see it for himself, and uh, and um, and that's what uh, that's what you guys are going to witness. One more. You said earlier this week the White House would release the results of the president's physical in the next couple of months. Yep. Has he completed his physical yet? Uh, I I don't have any news uh, to share about uh, where he is uh, with the he physical. Said he would do it by the end of the year. Uh, and uh, well, I had, I think I had said in a couple of months. I don't think I've ever said in the end of the year. You said on Thanksgiving okay. that he had completed part of his. Right, and I was asked, and I said it will happen in the next couple of months and I've also said that it will be transparent uh, and we will share all the information with all of you just like we did uh, and back in 2021 so there will be no change in how we share uh, that information well if you were if you watched the president in November you saw that he had he traveled to Indonesia Cambodia North North Africa he traveled across the country uh, and so he had a, a very uh, hectic uh, schedule and I think that plays into what his doctors have said right his doctor has said is that uh, he's in good health he's in uh, a very good health and that uh, he's leads an active life as we saw in November and in December Go ahead, Joey. Yeah, yeah. Green, oh uh, we have together Joey you're the last well, one. Real quick, uh, following up on that question I just want to clarify why make the trip now not six months ago not a year ago well we're clearly heading to Mexico City so okay, it made yeah. sense to it made sense to go it made sense to make a stop to see uh, to see what uh, uh, what border enforcement uh, uh, operations were like and meet those local uh, officials who have been who have been impacted. And then specifically, what is the president looking for from Mexico to help with the United States uh, immigration and migration challenges? In addition to the what was announced yesterday, them uh, Mexico willing to accept thirty thousand. Immigrant migrants from each of those four countries to return them. So, so I'm, I, I'm not going to get ahead of, of the meetings that will be occurring in the next uh, early next week. Uh, we will have a readout of those meetings and lay out uh, the deliverables, uh, and so we'll certainly have more to share. But look, when it comes to Mexico and Canada, they are, our, as you know, our closest neighbors. Uh, they have been partners with us uh, on this issue. It clearly, uh, um, irregular migration is going to come up as one of the uh, uh, as part of the agenda uh, the next uh, early next week, and uh, and so we're going to continue working with them in this partnership. But I don't want to get ahead of the president and the deliverables. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Thank you.